This is an ABC podcast. There are fears some sick Australians will suffer needlessly after a producer of medicinal cannabis had her home raided by police. Jenny Hallam supplied cannabis oil free of charge. Almost three years ago, Jenny Hallam's house was raided. The police came in, they found a heap of cannabis and cannabis oil, and they arrested her. Yesterday, a judge let her off without a criminal conviction. I'm Stephen Stockwell. And I'm Ange Lavoie-Pierre. And today on The Signal, medical cannabis has been legalised. So why are sick people still getting it illegally? And could that change? So Jenny Allen's kind of a strange case, right? Yeah, she's not your standard drug dealer by any means. But up until yesterday, she was staring down a possible prison term for cooking up and distributing a lot of cannabis products from her home just north of Adelaide. Right. And the reason that this is such a strange case is that Jenny's customers were exclusively sick people. In fact, customers isn't even the right word because she was giving this stuff away. And the path that led her to that point was very unlucky. Um, I was extremely ill myself. I'd been in um, six car accidents that hadn't been my fault. So I'd been rear-ended while stationary three times, hit from the side, hit from the front, and had a 40-foot pine tree drop on top of my car Good over Lord. a course of 10 years. Yeah. Um, by the end of it, I was suffering from um, just chronic body-wide pain, nerve damage, uh, something called fibromyalgia, and the doctors just didn't know what to do about it. They would just throw whatever drugs they could possibly throw at you, and that's what they were doing with me. They were just trying every drug they could find, and I was just getting sicker and sicker and and wasting away and and um and I just couldn't accept that I couldn't accept that that's all there was and when I heard that there was another option I thought I have to try it for my own benefit I wasn't just going to die and I knew cannabis was illegal but I thought well surely they would understand so in 2014 she started cooking up these cannabis products like some sort of kitchen MacGyver it was just a matter of getting some coconut oil and putting it in a slow cooker and that's all I was doing. I was just, at the beginning. I was doing the easy one. I was just getting a little bit of cannabis, a little bit of coconut oil, and chucking it in a slow cooker. And and that was it. And that's all I needed to do. It wasn't dangerous. Um, it wasn't difficult. And that was enough to save my life. That was enough to get it uh, to get me start getting me off the opiates. And you know, after going off all those medications, I feel better than I ever have. At what point did you go from making this product for yourself to to thinking about making it for a bigger market and supplying it to other people who who you thought needed it? Um, Well, I didn't really think about a bigger market. I'd never thought about a bigger market. At the beginning, it was just like, I made it for myself. I was feeling heaps better. And people close to me looked at me and said, wow, like, you know, people had known me for 20 years and known how bad I'd gotten. Um, And so when they saw me and saw how healthy I was looking and and the fact that I was moving around and I was doing the things I was working again. And, and they would ask me, like, what are you doing? What's going on? And I'd say, oh, I'm, I've, I've started using cannabis oil, you know, and I'd sort of whisper it in their ear and, you know, and I'd sort of say, you know, this is what I'm doing, but you can't tell anyone and, you know, you've got to keep it quiet. And, but it's really, really working. And, you know, and I've done some research and I'd explain it to them. And, you know, the next thing you know, they'd come back to me and say, hey, well, I'm sick or my friend's sick or my father's sick, you know, can can we try a little bit? And I had so much of it, you know, it was just, I had all this left over and I thought, well, you know, why not? You know, and I sort of didn't really think about it at the time as supplying a dangerous drug, you know, which is what it was considered. At your peak, Jenny, how much of this oil were you producing and, and how many people were you were you dishing it out to? Um, well, quite a lot. At the, when I was really, at, at towards the end, just before I got raided, I was just working at my absolute maximum. So um, I was... Um, I was probably pumping out probably about 100 grams of the full extract oil every week um, and probably a few litres of the coconut oil. Yeah, so there was probably about 70 people that I was actively helping, but I had helped about 200 by the time I'd been raided. So whereabouts so, whereabouts in Australia were the people that you were supplying to? Those 70 people, were they, you know, all over the place or just nearby? They were all over Australia, down in Tasmania, New South Wales, um, WA, quite a few in WA. I think Northern Territory. I think I don't. I think there was only one person I ever helped in Northern Territory. Um, but yeah, pretty much everywhere in Australia. Yeah. And Jenny, in 2017, your home gets raided because you're producing all this stuff. Can you mm-hmm. take us through that day? Like, how did it, how did it unfold? Well, I was actually really, really sick that day. I'd, um, it was the week after Christmas. So um, on Christmas Day, I jumped into a swimming pool and blown my eardrums out. So the day that they came was the first day I'd actually been able to even get out of bed, um, just sort of looking out the front window thinking, you know, this isn't going to be a good day. 
Um, and then it got extremely worse when four police officers just appeared at my front window. And then because I had a little dog at the time, the front door was sort of propped open so he could go outside whenever he wanted. And so they just walked straight in. And so I couldn't even, I didn't even have time to stash anything or do anything. And I had oil sitting out on the table and I had lots and lots of dried cannabis around the house. Um, drying out in the house and that so um yeah so I, I could, there was no time to hide anything um there was no time to do anything it was just a matter of um yeah just suffer the consequences basically so when they were at the door i actually said to them look because i had a warrant i said yeah i said you're gonna come in here i said you're gonna find cannabis and he said and i said you're gonna find cannabis oil so um yeah it was it was not a good day so when the police were raiding your property what was their approach like were they uh, rude or were they kind of, was it quite a sort of um, civil process what was it like um to start off with they were they were a bit rude they were a bit bullyish because I've never been raided before so I don't know what I'm supposed to do and so they were asking me questions and I wasn't hiding anything I was saying yep this is this this is this I've got some here I've got some there and so they asked me a question about something and I had to get up to show them something and then they yelled at me for getting up and going towards whatever it was and, I, and up until then I was I was nice and I was um, respectful. And at that point I thought, no, I've, I've had enough now. And I turned around and I said, excuse me. I said, but I don't know what usually happens in these situations. I've never been raided before. So if you'd like to be just a little bit more respectful to me like I've been to you, I'd really appreciate that. You know, I said, like, I haven't been nasty to you. I haven't been aggressive towards you. I'd appreciate it if you don't treat me like I'm a piece of shit. Mm-hmm. And he basically looked at me and went, oh, oh, okay then. And then from after that, they were much nicer to me. I think they sort of realised what was going on and that it wasn't, it wasn't what they thought when they first got there. I think when they first got there, they thought it was your typical drug dealer manufacturing stuff for rec purposes, purposes and, you know, that's what they usually go to. So that's what I think what they were expecting. And I think once they realised that it wasn't anything like that, they changed a little bit. And so by the end of it, they were more positive towards me. And at one point I actually said to them, look, if this was your children, you know, your kids, and you'd been told to take them home and basically spend the time with them until they die because there's nothing else that will help them. I said, would you just give up? I said, would you look for something that helped even if it was illegal? And one of them, and I don't want to identify them, but one of them said to me, look, he said, I would really hope it would be legal by then. But yeah, he said, I would I would want to try. And so by this point in early 2017, using medical cannabis was legal. It was legalised federally on November 1st, 2016, by the then Health Minister, Susan Lee. This is a process and a product that we need to bring to the Australian people. We can lead the world in this important area of health science. And a lot of people assumed that the battle to access legal medicinal cannabis was over, but they were wrong. So I'm Reese Cohen. I'm the Principal Consultant at Freshleaf Analytics. What's Freshleaf Analytics? Uh, it's a it's a strategic consulting company for the cannabis industry. Oh. We have them now. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that was a thing. It's a thing. Yeah, cool. It's a thing. All right. In 2017, when Jenny was arrested, you could probably count the number of medical cannabis, legal medical cannabis patients in Australia on two hands. The system was very cumbersome initially. Why was the system so bad in 2016, 2017? It was a new system, right? So any new government approval system is going to have a lot of problems if that's just how the world works. I think at the time there was a lot of anxiety on behalf of the regulators and the medical community um, around allowing these unregistered, you know, cannabis medicines to be prescribed. And so, you know, there were a lot of uh, checks and balances put in place to ensure that, you know, they didn't end up being prescribed in dangerous ways or harmful ways. And, uh, you know, it, it took it took a while for the regulators to realise that they'd basically been too far on the on the restriction side of things and needed to loosen stuff up. So in the beginning, even though it was legal, the approval process was pretty cumbersome. Right. So people like Jenny popped up with this black market supply. And while we don't have exact numbers, according to Reese, that market still exists today. I've had some people estimate that genuine medical cannabis users who are using cannabis to treat a specific uh, condition Black market, you know, you might be looking at 100 to 300,000 or or more. So now that it's legal, why do we still have so many people using illegally gotten cannabis products for medicinal purposes? Um, There's probably, there's a few main reasons why the black market uh, continues to to have, you know, so many people participating in it. Um, First of all, 
you know, legal medical cannabis in Australia is still quite new. And for a, you know, quite uh, new therapeutic product range that most doctors aren't familiar with, um, it's probably not surprising that it's taken us a while to get to where we are now in terms of how many patients are getting access. I think primarily it's about uh, doctor education. So most doctors aren't trained on cannabinoid therapies. They're not familiar with it. They don't know the, uh, the bureaucratic pathways that they have to go through in order to prescribe. Uh, and so, you know, even though loads of GPs and loads of doctors in Australia are getting inquiries from their patients about medical cannabis, the answer that they get usually is, well, I don't know anything about that. I uh, can't help you out. Is price also a factor as well? Yeah, price is definitely a factor. Um, I mean, Freshleaf Analytics, we've got some some of our own sort of in-house data. And on average, people are spending between 5 and $15 a day on their medical, on their prescribed uh, cannabis medicines, which is, you know, not not cheap. But I think the confusion sometimes is that's most patients. Uh, when we're talking about epilepsy patients, they require extraordinarily huge amounts um, of cannabinoids to, to achieve therapeutic efficacy. So epilepsy patients are spending more like $50 a day on their medical cannabis. And when you're looking at getting access to legal medical cannabis in Australia, what are the conditions uh-huh. that you can get that for? So the most commonly prescribed condition is chronic pain, but there's actually no finite list of conditions that you have to sort of fit into a box. That's one of the really great things about the Australian access system is that it's not prescriptive in terms of which conditions are approved and which ones aren't. Obviously, the more evidence there is that cannabis may be effective for your particular condition, the more likely you are to get a doctor to write you a script for it, the more likely that the Therapeutic Goods Administration is going to be to approve it. But we've seen people get approved for medical cannabis therapies for a whole variety of, of, uh, of conditions, some of which are quite quite rare, some of which have very little um, medical evidence behind them. So it, it's really up to the individual doctor to make a case to the Department of Health as to why they think that cannabis medicine should be trialled for that patient. Okay, so access is way better now. Yeah, provided you can afford it. And the whole time the process was being fixed up, Jenny Hallam was facing charges of possessing and manufacturing a controlled drug. She pleaded guilty, even knowing that that could mean years in jail. Yeah, but yesterday at the Adelaide District Court, the judge let her go with a good behaviour bond. In fact, he didn't even record a conviction. And when he explained why, he said Jenny was motivated by genuine compassion. It's over. Um, I want to thank Judge Julio, His Honour, um, for granting a no conviction. Um, to me, it sends a message. What that was that moment like when you got that news in the court? Um, to be honest, I, I wasn't sure if I'd heard it properly. So the first couple of seconds was me just looking at everybody um, in the gallery, just like, what, what just happened? What just happened? And they were all just like jumping up and down and almost screaming, like, but silently. <laughs> Um, and I sort of, I thought, okay, it, this, this must be good. This must be it sort of thing. Um, and then when I got up to actually sign and everything, I saw the paperwork and it was like, yep, yeah, that, that was definitely a no conviction. And so it, it didn't, it really didn't hit me. And, and, and it sort of it hasn't really hit me now. It doesn't really feel real yet. It doesn't really feel like it's over yet. Um, I'm sure it will sink in later when it's quiet. And I've got a moment to just sort of, um, you know, sit in the dark and just actually think about it and breathe. You've just been through this three-year ordeal. Will you stop manufacturing and, and supplying it in the way that you were or, or are you going to keep oh, it up? Definitely. Oh, no, definitely, no. There's no more manufacturing illegal cannabis oil for me. Um, that's 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 part of my life is now over. I did what I did for um, as long as I could and I helped as many people as I could. But um, I've, I'm on a two-year bond now. If I get into any sort of trouble, I go to jail, straight to jail, do not pass go, do not collect $200, it's over. And I'm not willing to give up any more of my life um, to help other people. That's something that now people have to take, just like I did, people have to take it in their own hands and take responsibility for their own health and make themselves better. You know, at the, at the end of, uh, of 2018, there were maybe a thousand active patients in Australia. By the end of this year, there'll be about 10,000. And according to our calculations, by the end of next year, there'll be closer to maybe like 40 or 50,000. So we're now hitting this point of near exponential growth, mostly depending on the particular place you're in. The regulations have been streamlined to an extent that it's no longer impossible. And in some cases, it's not that difficult for an approval to, to come through. 
So I think, and I hope, over the next couple of years, we'll see the system emerge from the fringes into the more mainstream and uh, and be able to get a lot more people access to the medicine they need. And potentially removing the need for people like Jenny to, to make the product that she was making. That'd be great. No one should be expected to grow their own antibiotics at home, right? We wouldn't expect anyone to, to have to be in a position where they needed to make their own medicine in any other field. And I think the same is the, is the case for cannabis. No one should have to cultivate their own cannabis Um, they should be able to get it prescribed to them by a doctor. That's it for today's episode of The Signal, and that is it for the week as well. And if you are looking for a slightly longer listen over the weekend, uh, make sure you check out our special episode that we did on Monday of this week called How Bad Could 88 Days Be? It's an episode about 88 days of farm work for a visa, sometimes being paid $3 an hour. Fun. (laughs) And we'll be back in your feed on Monday. Bye. See ya. You've been listening to an ABC podcast. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.